Welcome, everyone. Uh, stop me if you've heard this one, but uh, an American woman, a French guy, a Chinese man, and an Italian guy walked into a room. Does anybody know this? No. Uh, what about the one where the millennial, the Gen X, and the baby boomers walked into the room? Well, that just about sums up where we are in wealth management for the digital age. So my name is April Rudin, and I'm here from the US. I'm excited to be here at the Paris FinTech Forum. Uh, 10 years ago, I founded my firm, which is a wealth management marketing firm. And we're here today to talk a little bit about wealth management and where we are at the digital age. So to introduce my panel, I wanted to just ask them a question to uh, frame up a little bit about them. So um, Fred, we're going to start with you, Jean Bon, from uh, BNP Paribas. What are you most excited about and proud about your terms of, in terms of uh, achievements for this year? And what do you hope to accomplish for next year? Good morning to uh, you all. I'm very, very happy to be with you today. And uh, thank you, April, for, for your question. Uh, as you know, I, um, I lead an asset management company, BNP Paribas Asset Management. And last year, we took a majority stake into uh, Gambit Financial Solutions, a very well recognized Belgium fintech specializing in robot device services and customization of uh, client journey for, for investing. And this has been super exciting for us because, as you know, we are a fairly large asset management company, a so-called incumbent, and we're now partnering with a fintech to develop a new value proposition for our clients. And we're very, very excited that we are now in a position to roll out this new value proposition to all the BNP Paribas networks in Europe. Hi, everyone. I'm Chao Zhu. Apparently, um, I'm from China, so I'm going to try to bring some new things on the table. Uh, I started a company called Asset Pro, which is also one of the most you know, proud things I achieved last year. We helped more than 200,000 Chinese investors to invest globally um, because we are enjoying the great infrastructure of uh, internet age, especially with the support of Alibaba and Tencent made it so possible for mobile payment. So about 50% of our transaction is completely done online for cross-border transaction. So I think that's one thing that I would love to you know, share with you guys today. And uh, that's actually, we create a new possibility for the asset you know, transition uh, from one country to another, one continent to another. So that's what I'm most proud of last year. Thank Great. you. Great, hello. Yes, good morning everybody. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Um, so <clears throat> big achievement on, on 2018, I would say, we close a nice round, which for, uh, you know, an old startup or a scale-up is always nice things to have. Um, but probably from the industrial standpoint of view, we, we acquire a company in, in Germany called Bamo. Um, we are currently uh, running our business in Italy and UK, and with the Bamo acquisition, this will lead us to a third country in 2018. And also an interesting signal that there's, I would say, starting some idea, I wouldn't say, you know, trend of consolidation, but at least some uh, larger player uh, are emerging in Europe, um, which they are defining a bit the, the landscape of the of the digital wealth management. So, interesting year. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. So let, let's dig right in, Fred. Um, just to level set everything here, what are some of the different models that you've seen for uh, robo advisory, and how do you see this evolving? Well, it, it's true that it might look a bit like a complex or complicated space. Uh, and I'm sure you've, you guys have heard a lot of things about robo-advisory in the course of uh, yesterday and probably today. To, to simplify, I think we can say there are three, sch schematically, three types of business models or type of services in robo-advisory. The first one is pure B2C. This is what, I guess, Paolo and his firm are doing, where basically the whole process is fully automated, including relationship with the clients. The second one is basically where the end clients has access to a automated portfolio construction systems and access to funds, but is augmented by a human financial advisor. And the last one is B2B, where basically the client doesn't have access to uh, the robot voice services, only the advisor so, has so, and the advisor using this toolkit to help the, the clients making the right choices. Those models are, of course, moving and, and evolving. What is fair to say is that uh, in the US, large 
incumbents like Schwab and a few others have seriously invested into the so-called augmented model. And at the beginning, they were kind of cannibalizing their own uh, client franchise. Now they're getting new clients and adding assets at a pace which is far faster, a lot faster than the one of their other peers. The second thing to say is that uh, the pure B2C model is also morphing. And there are a lot of B2C independent companies who are now thinking about adding up B2B services to their pure B2C model. Two other things, portfolio constructions uh, has been fundamentally transformed by tech and by the, ad, by the progress of robo-advisory. Uh, robo-advisory for most of them use sophisticated, sophisticated elements of their platform to guess fairly well risk aversion, preference, choices, and objective of their clients in order to tailor-made, very customized portfolios almost to, down to the level of individual clients. And this is set to continue and will probably transform the way portfolios are constructed. The last thing to say is that most robot advisory services and companies are actually adding new services to the platform. For most of them, this is about better targeting, helping the advisor in his marketing effort, but also for many of them, it is about adding new services. And we've seen some of them morphing into pure retail platform. I guess we all heard about the Goldman Sachs, Marcus, Nutmeg initiative. Some of the one will also transform into kind of training execution type of platform. So the space is moving very fast. The three types of type of services, uh, they are evolving fast. They are transforming the portfolio constructions. And I guess this is going to continue probably one of the most interesting space to watch over the course of the next few years. Well, I think so. Uh, so Paulo, from your standpoint, uh, independent robo-advisor, incumbent, what does the landscape sort of look like from your point of view? Yeah, so, well, first of all, I, I, I very much agree with the, with the description. Our experience has been moving, well, we start to be you know, in, in, in this, um, in this uh, game for now a few years, and um, it took us very little to understand, at least from our perspective, that uh, the hybrid solution was the one that they want, we wanted to perceive, right? We, we, we started with a pure digital proposition, and we understood that it's still very, in, in, in very short time that this is a place in which um, it's the client that requires different type of interaction and you can leave them the choice, right? Whether to go completely digital or to have someone on the back which is gonna be you know, a, a dedicated customer service, a proper uh, professional that could help them uh, in, 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 in building this one. And, um, and, and, and I would also add this uh, B2C versus B2B, very much true. Uh, probably in U.S. we have seen these things in a more clear way, whether taking one road or the other. Uh, Europe has been a bit more, I uh, would say, blurred. Um, it is true that now there are um, more and more opportunity in order to build partnership at European level, uh, which will probably generate opportunity, right, in the in the robot space for building and and basically to test what is has, has always been a bit of the big question, which is. Uh, you know, Robo has technology and new products, incumbent has a lot of clients that are potentially, I wouldn't say underserved, but not properly served for certain type of uh, solution. Um, you know, why don't we try to put the things together, right? And, and this, is, this is an interesting, has always been difficult, um, but it seems that there are a few things that are opening the market. Uh, if I may, I'd yes. like to react on the so-called incumbent. Um, I think it's fair to say what we've seen ourselves being an incumbent uh, is that, uh, you know, relationship matters and uh, this immense uh, wealth of relationships some of the wealth managers have developed with individuals and families, the reassuring aspect of the brand, the fact that they know their clients uh, very, very well, uh, has been a very, a very, very differentiating factor in the way we can roll out new services and digitalized services. So. I would totally agree with uh, Paolo in the sense that there's room for both and there's room for intense cooperations and partnership between uh, the fintech and the so-called incumbents at digitalizing more the services we give to, uh, to clients. I think it's clear now that clients are really uh, at the center of things and that's what's really changed. Uh, so that the one size fits all model doesn't really work anymore and uh, people have want the freedom of choice for whatever the model is and to sort of cobble together what they want. Um, I was gonna ask a follow-on question which will move us on to Chow. 
which is uh, how does high net worth pay, play into this market? Um, what's happening in China that our audience should really be aware of? Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited to hear. I heard there's a lot of money there. Is that true? Well, I guess everybody wants Chinese money, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, not only that. I think uh, Chinese investors want more than just B2B or B2C. They want an S to B2C. What that means is uh, China, I, I feel like the same way in France, a lot of people value about people relationship. So no matter how efficient, how exact the uh, robot advisory could be, they still want people to have the human touch. So in that case, Chinese people want a 2C model, B2C model is they want someone, a human being, or like an advisor or like wealth management institutions to help them to give them advice, even though the advice could come from a, you know, a really scientific designed or the robot advisory services. Why I'm talking about S to B2C, S represent supply. They not only want the product that is already on the market, they're trying to get the opinion across uh, the asset management firm, they want to tell the asset management firm, hey, this is what I want. For example, last year, the Hong Kong stock market has experiencing a roller coaster experiences. Uh, at the beginning of the year, the price was so high, everybody is so optimistic. At the end of the year, you know, 95% of the stock at an IPO, the, you know, break their price at the first day or second. So in that case, people are asking for, pro for products that fit their needs, no matter if it's a robot advisory or not. So they are asking for a faster or more efficient way to communicate with the asset developer. So that's what I'm saying, like the Chinese investors are used to the internet technology. They are all so comfortable with communicating with a faster speed than normal than the previous wealth management institutions, you know, pattern. So what we are seeing is, one, they still need a personal touch, they need a human touch. So 2C model, B2C model is still working there. Two, they, are also want, they always want to talk to the developer of the asset. They want to tell them what they want. So essentially, that's what we were trying to do. Coming from a bank background of working in the big banks for like a couple of years, that I was um, one to design the fixed income product as well, and my partner was doing that in the bank anyway. But right now, we're opening up the doors for individuals, but not directly to the individual. We work with the advisors, wealth management institutions. So in that case, a lot of institutions actually does not have the capability of asset management. Because a lot of time we confuse the wealth management and asset management. Asset management actually, they do not touch client for most of the time, but wealth management does. So what we are doing, we are supporting them and empowering them be to become an ecosystem. So we enable them to have their voice come across to the people actually who design products. Uh, yesterday I was having a meeting with a couple of hedge funds here. They were asking me the question, what Chinese investor want? I was like, that's the right question to ask. Because that's the time you really understand client concentrated services was the future. No matter it's a robot advisory or just human advisory, whatsoever, it's advisory. It's supposed to serve the client to the end. Yeah. Let me just ask one follow on question to all of you also. Uh, we're here at Paris FinTech Forum. Lots of talk about FinTech as the large category. Uh, why has wealth management been so slow? Uh, is it because it's a relationship business? Is it digitalization versus digitization? Uh, maybe Paulo, you can take on that. Yeah, no, it's 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 absolutely a fair point. So there's been other part of this, uh, you know, fintech revolution that says that has moved uh, faster um, in terms of acquisition list of positioning. Right, there, there are still a lot of. Um, big challenge to be faced by the industry overall in terms of profitability and position and so forth. Uh, in the, in the staying on, on our space, I think that it's, it's, it's the sum of a series of elements, right? When we're talking, well, first of all, you know, our clients uh, need to trust us very profoundly, right? And before gaining a trust for someone that, you know, gives you 30, 40,000 euro to manage, well, it's, uh, it's, it's different than opening a bank account and transferring some money from one place to the other or do a payment. So um, brand building and, uh, and, and uh, you know, creating a proper trust relationship takes time. And, and then there's the second element, which is you know, changing habits and changing the way in which think, people think uh, how to invest their money. Right? Especially, I would say, European country, a bit less so UK, in which uh, RDR in 2012 has opened uh, the conversation, right, in terms of product versus services. Well, now it's happening now in, in, in Europe with MIFI too, but in other words, try to identify a bit better the distinction between 
a product and a service and the associated cost. Well, this means that until today, this has been completely blurred. So, you know, an average client that wasn't really aware of the concepts uh, in depth of, of, of a service. Um, I think these are probably the two most relevant elements that, that, that uh, means that it takes a bit longer. Uh, on the other side, just briefly, uh, I think that this is sort of inevitable, right? Between regulation on one side and the type of, you know, new way in which people want to interact with services. And I'm thinking about purely financial services and think about a lot of different things, right? If you are able to subscribe a, 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 um, a Netflix uh, uh, monthly, you know, uh, subscription, you know, in order to see whatever you like, why shouldn't I be in a position to have everyday information about my money, right? This is kind of, I think, the, the things that will become more and more evident. Yes, no, I think friend. I could actually echo that. Um, first of all, it's true that uh, when you look at M&A activities, uh, first half of last year, I think the amount of M&A activities in uh, financial business services has been three times or four times the one dedicated to wealth and asset management. So it's true that for the time being, it doesn't seem to be a super, super interesting space to be. Uh, in fact, I would totally echo uh, what Paolo says, that the combination of uh, you know, regulatory pressure, a bit of cost pressure also, but also this idea that you know, most customer wants to express their own choice, their own preferences. They don't want to be imposed a certain portfolio, or so-called model portfolio, like it is the same for everybody. They don't want to be, not only they want to choose their own risk profile, but they want to choose their own objectives, but also they want to choose their own preferences. Some of them would rather invest into uh, ESG products, some of them prefer to index in other type of products. And the more these millenniums, these new type of clients become the wealthy ones, the more there will be opportunities in uh, tech, in wealth management and asset management. So, uh, as I said before, I, I think this is about to start. Yeah, Chao? Yeah, I think in China, we, what we have seen this, um, is some of the things has already been done. So I can't say it's slow, but there's one thing that I always think about. Is there any part of the wealth management will not be able to be replaced by machine? Or are we really going to replace all of what people was doing in the process? Because it um, depends on the generation. I was born in the 1980s. But if you are asking someone who were born in the 2000s, millennial, so after 10 years, they'll become the major group of investment. They will have different behavior pattern as we do, rather than say as my parents' generation do. So what happened is I believe uh, this process has been taken place. And uh, it was not slow. It's just like some part of it, we just could not replace it. And uh, for some part of it, especially in China, like w what we are seeing right now, uh, people's behavior are tracked online for a lot of places already. So for a lot of lending, for a lot of like uh, behavior, like e online, you already be able to robotize that. And we already, we have already done that. But one thing that I think will not be changed or be replaced at this in the next 10 years is a human touch, like for those high end clients, especially if you come to a private banking, level of investment, you probably still need someone to sit beside you and talk to you. And, uh, but if you are talking about a small amount of investment, it's already online. It's already auto, automa automatically done. A lot of things are done by the machine. So that's what I feel. And uh, that's also regarding one thing that I find really interesting these few days. I was walking downstairs. The regulation and the infrastructure are playing an important role. If people are so used to mobile payment, they are that way easier to accept the robot advisory. If the regulator is more advanced or in a way more aggressive in terms of allowing new technology to get into the financial world, I will see that going on faster. That's what happened to Hong Kong. Hong Kong's SFC has been giving a lot of room for the, for the companies to actually operate, which boosted the whole environment of the robot advisor as well as the, you know, the, I would say the wealth management at a digital era. Well, I think what we've seen, especially in the U.S., too, is a shift away from uh, just portfolio management into holistic financial planning. So when you think about robo-advice, that's really just a part of uh, investment management rather than the whole holistic planning. So there's certainly a lot of different um, areas and room in there to uh, follow on. I don't know what you each, Paolo, you want to maybe weigh in on that? No, it's, it's, it's true, uh, and, I, and I'm... I'm convinced we're really at the beginning, right? Yeah. Uh, 
in, in all fairness, uh, this has been al also slow in terms of, of you know, uh, development. Um, I, I think there's plenty of space to grow in terms of the type of solution that um, data analysis and elaboration and IE could generate in this space until today. Honestly, um, I know, you know, I'm one of the, uh, the, the, the most guilty of the case, but you know, th th there has not been such amazing uh, development in terms of um, elaboration of new solution uh, in order to make things more sophisticated, right? Push the boundaries a bit higher in, in terms of uh, fulfilling clients' need. Uh, okay. It's still a pretty much defined space that is uh, the sum of a series of elements, which are, you know, you, you take all the, the managing a bit of the wealth and, and the pension and, and, and other couple of things. But of course, when you start thinking about a more holistic, there's, there's definitely way more, right? And, and this is why I do believe there's still a lot of space for, you know, you know, the human touch of the case and certain level of service uh, specifically dedicated to a certain uh, type of clients. But I also do believe that there are plenty of things to be done in the, in the tech space. Yeah, mm. okay. yeah. I'll echo that. Uh, I'll add that, uh, you know, one of the great benefits of tech in general and uh, fintech in particular is this phenomenal ability to uh, define, analyze, and sometimes predict the behavior of people in order to adapt a solutions almost down to the level of uh, the individual and personalize completely the, uh, the investment solutions, both in terms of return, but also in terms of preference, in terms of time horizon, in terms of uh, any kind of uh, choice the, uh, the end clients is going to want to, is going to make. And as we said before, the, the technology is not going to be the, uh, the constraints. The constraint is going to be more the business model and ultimately the client's uh, choice. A and I think FinTech in general and uh, this transformation happening in wealth and asset management as we speak is also a great opportunity to, to achieve what some call mass customization, which is that not everybody is going to have the same portfolios, not everybody is going to have the same solutions, and everybody is going to feel that the solution they get is one of their own, and technology will enable that. And I think this is probably one of the uh, biggest opportunity we, we, we've seen in that space, which is to customize at the level of the individual, something which up until now has been very much, uh, very much standardized. Yeah, no, just as a brief note on this one, because um, uh, there are some complexity when you're managing uh, wealth and expectation from clients. And one of the elements that, at least this is how I perceive it, is that emotional in the wealth management space is not exactly the right things you want to have when you're passing a message, for instance, right? So there's plenty of service which are online um, delivered. There are highly play on emotional set. Well, when you're talking about, you know, managing wealth for the long period, emotions, yes, are important, but you can play emotional in the way in which people decide. Right. So, you see, it's a bit of a tricky situation, right? In which, yes, you need to then have people engage, but you don't have to enter into a game in which you, are, you raise the emotional aspects, because then you are basically paying against their basic objectives. That's, so it's, uh, it's, this is one of the reasons why it's not so obvious, right? To define a new model. Yeah. Uh, Chow, you want to weigh in to this? Yeah, well, I just want to add one point because I really agree with both of that. And I think maybe in the future, who actually change the game might not necessarily be a financial institution. It could be a tech company. Uh, or in another way, uh, let me share a news. Just like last week, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, and Xiaomi, they just got a bank license in Hong Kong. So what, what it means, we're seeing a game from both sides. Uh, the financial institutions are learning about tax. They're trying to invest into the tech company, trying to get into the field, become more techy bank. But the other way, the tech company are trying to be more financial. They could be a financial technology company. So in that sense, I feel like this is like a race, which I think is great for this environment because at the end, the beneficiary will be the customer. Who are actually using this because we are so used to mobile payment and uh, you know share economy these days just because in the past 10 years we have done that so th in that case you know I believe there were a lot of problems to be solved but uh, I, I hope that's what be a thing that we can br embrace that in the in the future I think people get used to it people are not even talking about it because that's a part of their life 
So I think in the future, that's what we are trying to do as well. Trying to solve those problems could not be solved by the tech itself. And they're trying to find a balance. I think the balance is really important, but the balance different from market to market. Each yeah. market has different flavor of what they want in terms of like investment style. Yeah. So Fred is the last word. What comes next? Well, I hope we're giving you this idea that uh, this is about to become a very, very exciting place to be. Um, at BNP Paribas, we, uh, as you know, we, we have this idea that uh, partnering with fintech in wealth management, we know the aspect of what we do is, is key to our success and we're going to have to continue to, to do this and be good at it. Um, I think in tech and wealth management, um, the combination of new technology, uh, new regulations, specificities of countries, the rival of Millennium with a very, very clear preference for individual choice will make this space pretty exciting and ripe for new developments. We have this idea that uh, there's going to be plenty of space for uh, new fintech to develop services which either going to help companies like uh, Palo or Chao or companies like, like mine at uh, adding new quality services for, for benefiting clients. So, the conclusion is that uh, this is just the beginning, tech and wealth management, and uh, we are very, very convinced that uh, activities will increase and uh, the quality of the service we give to our clients will uh, be fundamentally transformed. Okay, great. A big round of applause for our panel here then. Thank you. Thank you.